right? That whole AIM phenomenon where like a little screen pops up on your on your computer and you can you can like type little messages to each other constantly, right? And so I thought, okay, um, well, I I work with youth. I want to be with it, I guess. I'll I'll do this. So I signed up for my very first AIM account, which is the AOL version of instant messaging. So uh, I have my account and I get to work, right? And on that first day, I kind of went through the routine as I always did. I got in, I turned on my computer, I checked my phone messages, and then I thought, well, what's the point of having an AIM account if I'm not going to use it? So I turned that on, right, because I'm going to check my email. And I sat down in front of my email, which is what I always always do first thing. And there I am, I'm rolling through my emails very happily, trying to focus and get to it. And then all of a sudden, whoop, comes the first message. And my coworker who was in the next building is like, hey. Right? So then I think, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, aim, right? So then I, I, I'm, I'm just about to hit back at them. And then all of a sudden, boink, another message comes up from one of my youth. And, and the youth is like, hey, so um, do we have youth group this Sunday? And I thought, okay, okay, okay. Now this one, right? So then I'm there and I'm, I'm telling. Him, and I don't think you're supposed to write big long messages on AIM, right? I'm like telling this big long thing about what we're doing that Sunday and everything that he needs to know. And in the meantime, my co worker has shot off all these questions like, Can you do this? Um, where is that happening? Uh, what and I'm like, like my old panic is beginning to rise up in me. And I confess, my armpits were getting sweaty, right? And I think, oh my goodness, what, who do I answer? Where do I focus? And then my phone rings, right? So I want to I wanna just ask, does that feel familiar? to any of your lines. I think sometimes we get those, those senses where we, we live lives where we have TVs in many rooms, if not all rooms. I was in a house not long ago that had TVs in the bathroom, too. I don't know how, how much time you're spending in there, but bathroom, TVs, okay. And then it's almost People have those surgically, like those earbuds, right, right, to their iPods, surgically, like, attached to them, and our phones are, are like, glued, permanently glued to our, to our hands. And never mind, like, like, all of the input that we're getting from our families, our parents, our spouses, our children, our coworkers, our friends. Every which way. And the question becomes, wow, what do we do with all of this constant input? Sometimes what it feels like to describe is how can we focus on anything? Never mind, right? Focusing on God and will for our life. I think sometimes that, in fact, is no longer necessary or valued in our 
world today. In our world of constant chatter, 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 and competing demands, we don't really have time to hang out in the wilderness, do we? I mean, it seems like a very, very boring place, disconnected and silent. one person, not even a person, the Holy Spirit with us the whole time. What would we talk about even after those first few days? Would we go crazy? Would we die of boredom? Would we encounter our own coming up for us? Or might we find in the wilderness, the desert, that our eyes sort of begin to do that thing where it begins to sharpen, and our mind seems to become decluttered and clear. And our spirit learn or relearn what it means to focus again. Let us pray. God, this morning we've been singing the words that we long for you, that we are lonely for you, that we are desperate for you. Sometimes I think my life is so loud that I don't touch those feelings really. So may it this morning, God, that, that we touch that longing, that we taste that, that desperation, and we come to experience the loneliness that, that it is without you. We pray all of this. In the name of Jesus is the Christ, our companion in the desert. Amen. Right before Jesus is driven into the wilderness, do you remember? We've been like skipping back and forth all over the gospel according to Luke. But, but right before that moment, that Jesus Jesus is driven out into the desert. He actually is baptized and anointed. Remember? We read that not too long ago, right at the beginning of Epiphany. And that, that voice, that voice from heaven comes and says to him, and this is important. I know we've talked about it several times, earlier, but that voice says to him, him, you are my child, my son. You are the beloved. In you, I am well pleased. This is important because it's in the wilderness that Jesus works out what that means. Right? He doesn't just go from there to nowhere. You see, I think it's not enough for us to be chosen and anointed, for us to be baptized and called. Just like Jesus, we need time for preparation. We have to 
figure out what it means to be the people of God and how, how to live it out in the world. Or else it becomes like, those are beautiful words, right? Oh, Jesus, beloved. Right? What does that mean? We don't know. When God liberated the Hebrew slaves from the land of Egypt, you remember that story? Where do they go next? And they're not there just for 40 days like Jesus. How how long are they there for? Folks remember? 40 years. And I want to suggest that perhaps it's because they had to come to unlearn what it meant to be slaves and to learn what it meant to be free. They had to unlearn what it meant and the habits of slavery and learn and unpack how to live and what it meant to be God's people. Now you might think, man, that that just takes so long. You know? I mean, after all, did they have to do that before they got to the land of Canaan? We might think of the wilderness just for today and perhaps just for the season and then as a place where we do the work of figuring out who we are how to live that. The wilderness then doesn't become an empty place. We learn from the scripture that it's at the end of the 40 days. Actually, I was reading a different version, so this might be a little bit of a different interpretation. From, um, it's at the end of the 40 days. We heard about how the devil was with Jesus all the time, right? right? Throughout the 40 days, tempting, tempting, tempting. But we do know that it's the conversation that happens with Jesus comes at the end of the 40 days. Didn't we just hear that? And I want to suggest that there's something significant about that. That the devil doesn't have that conversation at the beginning of the 40 days. He doesn't have it at the middle of the 40 days. But he has that conversation at the end. After, after Jesus has had time to talk to the Holy Spirit, to work things out, to ask questions, and to fast, right? So he gets to use that time to fast, to break from the habits that he might have gotten into, even our beloved Jesus. He fasted from his family. He even fasted from food. Why? So that he could come to an uncommon that we too need to grapple with in our own lives. Because as the devil asks him each of the three questions, he really only has one answer. Just one. And we might consider what that answer means to us this morning. His answer is, I will be obedient to God and God only. I will be obedient to God and God only. Now, you may 
be too cool for school and think the devil? What in the world do we mean by the devil showing up, right? Because some of us think of like the whole red outfit with the horns and, and, and everything else. And then we think of the, like, like the two, two little beings that sit on their shoulders. And we think, that's not, not real. What, what is that going on? Right? But it's important to know that in the Greek, the word for devil is diabolos. Anybody they speak Greek? I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Diabolos. And it actually translates to the slander. The slander. Now, what does that mean? The slander means that he presents things as factual or true that are actually false, harmful, and malicious. If I were to put it very simply, the devil is a liar. Right? The devil is a liar. That's what it means. And then we might ask the question, well, what does it mean? What does he lie about? Right? It doesn't seem like he's lying to Jesus. So let's look at it. basically presents Jesus with a lie about what it means to be the Son of God and how to live that out. Right? That thing that Jesus was working those 40 days, figuring out what does it mean? I've been told that I've been the Son of God. I'm told I'm the Beloved. I'm told with God, I am with God. God is well pleased with me, right? But what does that, how do I live? What will I do with that? And the first thing he's told is that, hey, he presents this image. Hey, the Son of God is one that can do magic tricks and take these stones and turn them into bread. That'd be pretty cool. That's a pretty cool son of God, right? The second lie that he presents is that he presents the son of God as one uh, who will be ruler. Like the kingly king. Imagine those like splendors and the gold and have authority and glory. That that is the Son of God. And the third thing that he presents is a picture of the Son of God who doesn't point to God, but points to himself by daring stunts, right? Risk-taking stunts, like leaping off the buildings and Calling out the whole legion of angels. Because after all, wow, if the angels will come out to do that, think what they can do. Now, it's, it's a little bit tricky, right? Because if Jesus can turn stone into bread for himself, that means he can do it for everybody that's hungry. And isn't that what Jesus is about? And if he could be, become the ruler, the king over all of the nations that the devil shows him, doesn't that mean he could actually institute the kingdom? of God here on earth 
as it is in heaven, just like he's supposed to. And isn't it the case that if he calls out those angels, wow, wink, wink, think of all that he could do with that legion of angels. Are you are you following the lies that we're hearing? Can I get a nod or a shake or like a oh, oh. Thank you. The devil even uses scripture to make his point, doesn't he? That last point, he talks about the song, Psalm 91, and he says, hey, come on. The scriptures even say so. I want to propose that. Think about it, right? Using scriptures to lie. Hmm. We, we might look around and notice that, that that might be happening in our world, right? I could probably preach a whole sermon on each, right? On each of those texts and questions that come to Jesus. Because surely we could figure out in our lives how they are living and how we ourselves experience them. And I invite you really to spend some time in the coming week actually looking at how these questions, the temptations and the tests show up in your life. But today I want to focus back again on Jesus' answer. Because it is there that Lent invites us to go. Through each of his answers, Jesus affirms that who he is as the one, the Son of God, and how he will live it out is finally rooted in God and in God's will. He says, we don't live by bread alone. He points to the scripture from Deuteronomy, but he, he attaches the second part, or he doesn't, but we can hear the echo. We do not live by bread alone, but by Every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. I will worship and serve God only. And so if gaining authority and glory and power, even if I put it to good use, comes at the cost of that, of worshiping you, no, no, no thank you. demonstrated in trust, not in coercing or manipulating God. Sum up. What is that? What is that one answer that I that I told you earlier that he had again and again? I will be obedient. I will be obedient to God. God only. Nothing, but nothing will move me from that focus, says Jesus. Friends, I think the Lenten journey is really about uncovering and recovering that same focus in our own life. To be obedient to God and God only. It requires us to follow the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness so that all the distractions, all the 
the lies, all of the glossy possibilities that we're presented with, all the time will be seen for what they are. The lesson journey invites us to make profound choices. What kind of child of God will you be? And how will you live that out? Will you, like Jesus, do the work with the Holy Spirit that will finally lead you home. We rejoice knowing that Jesus, right, is never, never alone in the desert. He's never abandoned by God. And we know, too, that in we too will go with God. So I want to extend the invitation. Come, all of you who have been called. Come, all of you that have inklings of the hunger in you. Come, all of you that know there is a longing in your heart. Let us head confidently into the wilderness together. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take a deep breath once again. invite you to stay in your row, and if you would greet the, the past peace of Christ, the person on your right and on your left, we will close our sermon time by moving into prayers of the people. Again, if you'll pass the peace to just the person on your right. Thank you.